everybody. Mark Fox here with Amazing Prophecy YouTube channel and Forever Free Ministries. If it's in the Bible, we want it. If it's not in the Bible, we don't want it. That is our motto at Amazing Prophecies YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe. Is there mathematical clinching proof that we are living in the last days, the end of time? Is there solid biblical evidence that confirms we are indeed living in the end of time? This is a powerful video broadcast that you want to watch the whole thing. This video, I believe, will inspire your faith and courage and confidence in God's Word that we are living in the very time of the end. The Bible coins that expression, time of the end. Are we, beyond a shadow of a doubt, living in the last days? Stay tuned. Okay, everybody, just before we dive into this very provocative subject of mathematical proof that we are living in the last days, I want to get this book in your hands. Now, I recognize thousands of you already have this book, but some of you have not received it yet. We offer it by an ebook. Uh, going to the graphics, this free book, Mark of the Beast, this blockbuster book, uh, we get it into your hands for free, a free ebook. Click on the link below in the dis video description. And if you can give a donation, it is greatly appreciated at this time, but it's not required. But you'll be able to give online or you can call us and give over the phone. And so a donation is appreciated. Also, we have a book offer. This is a large volume of hundreds and hundreds of pages of covering topics like the mark of the beast, the seal of God, the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, the second coming of Jesus Christ, the dark ages, the Roman papal power, and much more. It's entitled Great Controversy. And this special book has over, I think it's over 700 graphics, charts, prophetic charts in there, prophetic pictures to help to make the truth clear. Hundreds of skip scriptures are quoted in this book. Uh, for one book, like I say, this is a large edition. This one book is for $60 donation. It's book offer 20, number 21. For your donation of $60, you get one book. If you give a donation of $240, you get a whole case of them, six books at um, $40 each. Or if you want to give $420 donation, you'll receive two cases of books, 12 books, $35 each. You can donate by phone or you can donate by mail. We'd love to have you write us at Forever Free Ministries, P.O. Box 785, Lake Dallas, Texas 75065. And donate by phone at 855-336-3733. Also, uh, you can email us from around the world. We have a school of evangelism in the Philippines and so forth and doing global work. You can join us at Facebook, uh, memorizing God's word together. Also, one more announcement. Need help to find a Seventh-day Sabbath-keeping church near you? Just text us at 972-268-4555. You can just give us your name and city or you can email us and we'll get that to you. <clears throat> okay, mathematical proof we are living in the last days. Is it possible to know mathematically that we're living in the last days talked about in the Bible, in God's Word? Now, Jesus said that no one knows the day or the hour when he would come the second time. But of that day and hour, no one knows. No, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only, Matthew 24 and verse number 36. But what many Christians don't know is that the timing of God's last judgment, which takes place before Jesus returns, the second coming, we can in fact know. Revelation 14, 6 and 7, God's final warning. Then I saw another angel flying in the midair, <clears throat> and he had the eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue and people. He said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all the springs of water. Uh, Revelation 14, 6 and 7. <clears throat> now, how does the book of Daniel describe this end time hour of God's judgment? Look here, everybody. The Bible makes it very clear 
in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 and 10, it says that the holy angels are there at the throne and that God's throne would move from the holy place to the most holy place. And the Bible says the books were open. That would include the book of life. The books are open and it says the judgment has begun. It says the court is in session. It is convened. So the book of Daniel and Revelation go together. Daniel explains Revelation. Revelation explains Daniel. So both Daniel and the book of Revelation point to the hour of God's judgment that would occur before the second coming of Jesus Christ. So these are messages that must be preached around the world before Jesus comes again. I repeat, there's a judgment going on right now that involves God's professed people, professed Christians today. And so this hour of God's judgment, we know we're living in that time, but when did that begin? We know that it's not over yet. It has already begun. It's going on right now. And we're going to nail down exactly, precisely, unequivocally, unabashedly when this hour of God's judgment began. That we can see clinching proof that indeed we're living in the last days. Let's go back to the screen, everybody. And so we're living in God's judgment hour. And so does the Bible tell us exactly when God's hour of judgment has begun? If so, we can know for sure we are living in the last days beyond a shadow of a doubt. Now, the book of Daniel gives us this end time timetable in Daniel 8 and Daniel 9, okay? He said to me, this is an end time prophecy, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary, and I'm going to prove to you that sanctuary it's speaking about is in heaven, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. I'm going to prove to you that the sanctuary to be cleansed in heaven means that we're living in the hour of of God's judgment. It's synonymous. It equates. It goes together. Inseparable. The sanctuary being cleansed is the hour of God's judgment and it would begin at the close of the 2300 days. Now, this is very significant. In the books of Dan Revelation, a day is used as a symbol for a year. This symbolism is found in other parts of the Old Testament as well as in Daniel itself. Here we have this, uh, this gauge or this um, rule of thumb. In Ezekiel 4, 6 and Numbers 14, 34, I have appointed thee a day for a year. So we didn't make this up. This is in the Bible. Remember, if it's in the Bible, we want it. If it's not in the Bible, we don't want it. So what do we see in the Bible? We see that in in symbolic Bible prophecies, one symbolic day equals a literal year, a day for a year. So this is 2,300 years. And when would it begin? Now we know at the close of it, the cleansing of the sanctuary would commence, the judgment would commence, the court would be in session there in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, the heavenly temple. So we have this Bible's longest, most amazing prophecy of 2,300 years. So I'm going to prove to you that this 2,300 years began in 457 BC and would run out in what year? I'll show you precisely that it's 1844. Now, you might say, well, Mark, that's a long time ago. Noah preached judgment for 120 years, and then the rain fell. Well, friends, we've gone into overtime. We are now living an unusual hour of Earth's history. We're living in the judgment hour right now. Now, Daniel's stunning prophecies of Daniel 8 and Daniel 9 demand and deserve our undivided attention. I'm going to show you very quickly mathematical proof that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, and of course, mathematical proof now that we're living in the last days. These prophecies go together. They're all tucked away in Daniel 8 and Daniel 9. Now, Sir Isaac Newton was a, was a mathematician, a uh, scientist. He was uh, also an astute uh, Bible student of biblical prophecies. He loved to study prophecy. 
and he called this prophecy that we're going to look at right now in Daniel chapter 9, he called it the foundation stone of the Christian religion, the crown jewel of the Old Testament. And I wholeheartedly agree with Sir Isaac Newton. So did you know that there's mathematical clinching proof of, uh, in the book of Daniel that Jesus is indeed the Messiah? This is absolute proof that every Jew needs to hear. Every ag agnostic, a every infidel, every skeptic, every atheist needs to hear this prophecy. There's absolutely irrefutable, undeniable, mathematical proof that Jesus is the Messiah and every Jew, every Christian, every atheist, every skeptic needs to hear and understand this incredible prophecy because this amazing prophecy predicted the exact year Jesus would be baptized. It also predicted the exact year Jesus would be crucified. And so in the prophetic book of Daniel, we find the most amazing time prophecy in all the Bible. And here it is, quote, Daniel 9, verse 24, 70 weeks are determined for your people, the Jews, and for your holy city, that is Jerusalem. Now the word determined means allotted. It is allotted or carved out of this large prophecy of 2300 years. Well, 70 weeks would be a portion of that that would be given to your people, the Jews. What is the holy city? I repeat, Jerusalem. For your people, the Jews, and for your holy city, uh, Jerusalem. So, here we find that these 70 weeks were allotted for the Jews for a divine purpose. It concerns the future of God's people, the Jews, and their city, Jerusalem. It's very clear. Now we need to calculate how long is 70 weeks. Here we have 70 weeks, and since there are seven days in a week, it is easy math. 70 times seven equals 490, but they are symbolic prophetic days. So 490 years. Here is a key to unlocking this time prophecy. One prophetic day equals or stands for one literal year. God's word says, quote, I have laid on you a day for each year, Ezekiel 4, 6. So the 490 days are actually 490 literal years, and that's part of the 2300 year prophecy. So the prophecy continues. What was to be accomplished during this time period of 490 years? So the Bible says in Daniel 9, 24, what would this time period be for? It would be a probationary time for the Jews to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy, Daniel 9 and verse number 24. So the purpose of the 70 weeks, 490 years, was for the Jews to have a probationary time a testing time for heartfelt repentance of all their rebelliousness and their uh, sinful ways. And the prophecy continues to tell us that even the Messiah would come to bring salvation and make final appeals for them to repent of their sins, to abandon their pattern of sin. To seal up vision and prophecy means that the Messiah would confirm or fulfill this prophecy. And to anoint the most holy means that the heavenly sanctuary will be made ready for him. All right? Because that's the focus. Okay? It's focused on the Messiah and then ultimately the Messiah's work in the heavenly sanctuary. So this is very, very significant. Uh, to anoint the most holy means that the heavenly sanctuary will be made ready for him. Let's keep going. In this time prophecy, we have five key dramatic events predicted that are all tied to the 70 weeks of 490 years. Are you ready? Here they are. Fact number one, the first event on the prophetic timeline is the decree to restore Jerusalem, which was 457 BC, BC meaning before Christ. According to Daniel 9, 24, that would begin the 70 weeks of the 490 years. So when did the 490 year prophecy begin and end? What was the dramatic miraculous event predicted that marks the beginning of the 490 year prophecy? Quote, Daniel 9, 25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command or edict or law or legislation to restore and build Jerusalem, that's the kickoff. That's the trigger date, all right? So the trigger event. So according to Ezra chapter 7, 
the year when this authoritative decree to restore Jerusalem was issued was in, <clears throat> in the seventh year of the reign of the Persian king Artaxerxes, which was in the fall, keep that in mind, in the fall or the autumn of 457 BC. Now this royal decree finally allowed the Jews to return to their homeland to rebuild Jerusalem. Artaxerxes, king of kings, we read that this decree was issued in the seventh year of the reign of the Persian king Artaxerxes, which was 457 BC. Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace and so forth. I issue a decree that all those of the people of Israel and the priests and Levites in my realm who volunteer to go up to Jerusalem may go with you. Ezra 7, <clears throat> 7 uh, 12 and 13. So now we have the starting point for the 70 weeks or 490 years, namely 457 BC. And going forward on the prophetic timeline, this extends to 34 AD. Let's look at the chart. And by the way, we will be making these charts available. All you will need to do is click on the link below for we have a number of charts. <clears throat> this chart is known as the 2300 year prophecy. Notice below, go all the way down and you see for the Jewish nation, there would be 490 years. You see that at the bottom. 490 years would be for the Jewish nation to repent. And it would begin, as you see, 457 B.C. The decree to rebuild Jerusalem went forth. All right. So that's when the 2300 year prophecy began. But that's also the beginning of the 490 year prophecy, which was part of that. Let's keep going. <coughs> Excuse me. Fact number two, event number two on this prophetic timeline. The restoration of Jerusalem completed in seven weeks. Seven weeks means seven times seven equals 40, 400, 40, pardon me, 49 days or four, uh, pardon me, 49 years. Daniel 9, 25. Here you see another chart that we inserted in there in the green. Seven weeks or 49 years. So that was time in which Jerusalem would be rebuilt. So that takes us to 408 B.C. All right, so we inserted that there because that's the first part of the prophecy. We continue. So the first portion of Daniel's time prophecy predicted precisely how long it would take for the restoration of Jerusalem to be completed. 49 years, very clear. According to Daniel 9:25, it would be seven weeks or seven times seven, which is 49 days or 49 actual years. So when Daniel wrote this amazing time prophecy, he was an exile, a prisoner of war, a captive in the pagan city of Babylon. His Jewish homeland was in absolute desolation. And at the time, it looked impossible that the prized city Jerusalem in ruins would ever be rebuilt. And so we keep going. The prophecy predicted that the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times, according to Daniel 9:25. True to the prophecy, despite constant opposition, fierce attacks. Let me go back. Sorry about that. True to the prophecy, despite constant opposition, fierce attacks, and many difficulties, Jerusalem was rebuilt in 49 years after 457 B.C., which was 408 B.C. This was miraculous. Therefore, this portion of the time prophecy was fulfilled. Fact number three. Event number three along the prophetic timeline, the appearance of the Messiah. Well, what did the Bible say? Until, listen to this amazing prophecy, quote, until Messiah, the prince, who's that? That's Jesus. There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. All right, that's easy math. Notice the title, Messiah, the prince. Who is the Messiah? who is the Prince of Peace. According to Isaiah 9, 6, Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. So the time prophecy specifies exactly how many years it would be from 457 BC until the Messiah 
would appear. The Bible says seven weeks and three score and two weeks. This is seven weeks plus 60 weeks plus two weeks, which adds up to, very easy, 69 weeks. 69 times seven is 483 prophetic days or 483 actual years. Very simple. So again, the prophecies of Daniel predicted that from the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem in the fall of 457 BC until the coming of the Messiah would be 69 weeks or 483 years. All right. So since one prophetic day equals one literal year, 483 years from the going forth of the command to restore, rebuild Jerusalem to the appearance of Jesus, the Messiah, the anointing of the Messiah, would be in the spring of A.D. 27. So, <clears throat> according to the prophecy of Daniel, there would be 483 years, 69 weeks, from the decree to restore Jerusalem to the appearance of Messiah the Prince. 483 years after 457 B.C. Remember, there's no zero year. It brings us to the fall of A.D. 27. All right, this is very important indeed. So here you see in the chart AD 27. In the fall of AD 27, Jesus was baptized. So Jesus was baptized in AD 27. Very significant. All right, let's keep going. So the next piece of the puzzle. The word Christ in the Greek means the same thing as the Hebrew word Messiah. It means the anointed one. Well, how and when was Jesus anointed? At his baptism. The Bible tells us how Jesus was anointed, how God appointed, pardon me, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him, Acts 10, 38. This happened at Jesus' baptism. So does the Bible tell us in what year Jesus was baptized? Yes. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, what happened? Look down below there. The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. And it goes on to say that Jesus came to be baptized. Does the Bible tell us in what year Jesus was baptized? Yes. The 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar was 27 AD, according to secular history. And so <clears throat> when all the people were baptized, notice in the same chapter of Luke, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was open and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, you are my beloved son in you. I am well pleased. So Jesus was baptized on time in A.D. 27. Just think of it. For more than five centuries before the Messiah was even born, this astounding time prophecy in the book of Daniel predicted the exact year and time of the year that the Messiah would appear and be anointed at his baptism by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying, the time, that is the time prophecy is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel, Mark 1, 14 and 15. Then Jesus went on to say that these words he just read, he was fulfilling as he was claiming to be the Messiah. So Jesus was fully aware of his father's timetable. Here it is. The next piece of the puzzle would be the crucifixion of the Messiah, which would happen in the middle of of the final week or the middle of the last seven years of this prophecy of 490 years. So in the final week, that is in the final seven years of this 490 year prophecy, in the middle of it, that is in 31 AD, in the spring to be exact, the time of the Passover, Jesus was crucified as our Passover sacrifice. Fact number four, event number four. On the prophetic timeline, I repeat, the crucifixion of the Messiah, 31 AD. The prophecy tells us that in the final week, the Messiah shall be cut off. That's the crucifixion, but not for himself. He died for us. Jesus would be crucified, but not for himself. 
He was crucified not for his sins, but ours. Oh, friends, look here. This prophecy is telling us the exact year and time of the year, at the time of the Passover, when Jesus would be crucified. He died for your sins. He died for my sins. Let's keep going. And so we keep going. It would be in the middle of the final week of the 70 weeks or in the middle of the 70th week. All right. Uh, There it is in 31 AD. It would be in the middle of the final week of the 70 weeks or in the middle of the 70th week. So since the middle of seven is three and a half, therefore Jesus would be crucified after only three and a half short years from his baptism, which in the spring of AD 31. So more precisely, Jesus knew he would be crucified on the very day of the Passover and at the very hour of the evening sacrifice in the earthly sanctuary. Very precise. Jesus was fully aware of God's perfect and prophetic timing. He knew when to have the Last Supper. He knew what was coming up that night. So what dramatic event happened when Jesus died on the cross? God tore the veil of the temple from top to bottom. And so Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. It says in Mark 15 and Matthew 27. So the Bible said in Daniel 9, 27, then he, Jesus, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, that is seven years. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. In other words, he would be the sacrifice and cause all the animal sacrifices to be no longer necessary because they were merely a shadow of what was to come. Fact number five, event number five on the prophetic timeline, the final rejection of the Messiah and his salvation for the Jews. A.D. 31, the final rejection of the Messiah and his salvation by the Jews. And so he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Jesus was to confirm the covenant with his people, the Jews, for seven years, according to Daniel 9 and verse 27. So confirm the covenant with the Jews for seven years. The prophecy predicted that the Messiah would confirm the covenant for one week or seven years, but he was cut off in the middle of that time period in AD 31. I repeat, just three and a half years after he began his public ministry. So after he ascended to heaven, he continued to guide his apostles to go after the lost sheep of the house of Israel for three and a half years more years, thus continuing to confirm the covenant through his apostles. Thus, Jesus, through his apostles, confirmed the covenant with his people, the Jews, for three and a half more years to complete the final week or seven years of the 70 weeks or 490 year prophecy. And so Jesus confirmed the covenant in two stages, first in person for three and a half years, and then through the preaching of the apostles for three and a half additional years. So seven years he confirmed the covenant, first in person, then through the apostles. So what tragic event happened at the close of the final week, at the close of 490 year prophecy in AD 34? It was the stoning of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. He gave the last stirring call to the Jewish nation. And so then the Bible says, look at the red part in Acts 13. It says, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Everybody, that happened in AD 34. This time period ran out. And so that happened in AD 34. So Daniel 9, 24 to 27 has already been fulfilled. The decree to restore Jerusalem happened. Restoration of Jerusalem in 49 years, it happened. Restoration of Jerusalem amidst fierce persecution or opposition, uh, fulfilled. Anointing baptism of Messiah, fulfilled. Crucifixion of Messiah three and a half years after his baptism, fulfilled. Cause the sacrifice and oblations to cease in meaning when the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, fulfilled. Confirm the covenant with the Jews for seven years, first in person and then through the apostles, fulfilled. Gospel goes to the Gentiles at the end of the 490 years, fulfilled. 
the destruction of Jerusalem would occur sometime after the Messiah confirmed this uh, covenant with the Jews. That's all spoken of in Daniel 9, fulfilled. Does the Bible tell us when this heavenly judgment began? He has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And so, what is the Bible's longest time prophecy? In Daniel 8, 14, um, it makes it very clear, under 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. So, what does the day represent, I repeat, in Bible prophecy? According to Ezekiel 4, verse 6, one day equals a year. I have appointed the, I have appointed the one day for a year. 2300 years so in what year did jesus begin the heavenly judgment the judgment in the heavenly sanctuary according to daniel 8 and verse 14 for 2300 days then the sanctuary shall be cleansed daniel 8 and verse number 14 this is the bible's longest most amazing prophecy the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary begins at the close of the 2300 year prophecy and so there's no doubt about this when does the 2300 year prophecy begin? I repeat, Daniel 9:25 makes it very clear that it would be at the seventh year of the reign of King Artaxerxes, 457 BC. So therefore, we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the cleansing or the judgment in the heavenly sanctuary began in AD 1844. You say, Mark, that's a long time ago, but remember Noah preached judgment for 120 years. And so how long have we been living in the hour of God's judgment? Ever since 1844, we've been living in the last days. The focus is not on the earthly sanctuary anymore with the table of showbread and the candlesticks and so forth. No, now it is focused on the heavenly sanctuary. So which sanctuary should we focus on now? In Revelation 11:19 the heavenly sanctuary. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. That's in the most holy place. So where is Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary? He's in the most holy place. So what does the cleansing of the sanctuary mean? It means blotting out of the record of sin. It means blotting out the names of the unconverted from the book of life. So what are done with the names of some of those written in the book of life? Revelation 22, 18 and 19 makes it very clear that these are individuals that are removed from the book of life. And so that's very clear in the Bible. So when did Gabriel tell Daniel people would understand these prophecies? Daniel 12, verse 4, he says, in the time of the end. So how was the heavenly judgment foreshadowed or symbolized in the Old Testament? How was it symbolized? What does the Bible say about this heavenly judgment and the cleansing of the sanctuary and how this would all be symbolized? Every day there was an accumulated record of sin in the earthly sanctuary services. They would um, have animal sacrifices, but they would take the blood of some of these animal sacrifices and they would bring that within the veil, uh, or I should say within there in the holy place and sprinkle it before the veil. And so this was an accumulation of the record of sin symbolized here by these uh, rituals. So symbolically, the sin was transferred from the guilty sinner to the innocent lamb. And so the high priest brought some of the blood into the holy place, I repeat. So symbolically, the blood contained the record of sin. Thus, the sanctuary was being polluted, as it were, by the record of sin. The record was in symbol symbol symbolically given in the blood. So why did the high priest go into the most holy place on the final day of the year? To cleanse the sanctuary. The daily accumulation of the record of sin made a yearly cleansing of the sanctuary necessary. He would sprinkle, according to Leviticus 16, he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat seven times, symbolizing complete atonement or cleansing of the sanctuary. And so the earthly sanctuary was cleansed once a year at the end of the biblical year, the day of atonement. So he was 
only in the most holy place one day at the end of the biblical calendar. So Jesus now is in, as our great high priest, is in the most holy place, but the Ark of the Covenant, according to Revelation 11 and verse 19. So this was a solemn annual event that occurred there in Israel. And so uh, uh, among the Israelites, I should say, the trumpets blasted to announce the beginning of the cleansing of the sanctuary because it was a time of judgment. Any person who is not afflicted of soul, that is repenting of sin, on that same day, that person shall be cut off from his people. In other words, he would be separated from them. It was a time of judgment, Leviticus 23, verse 29. So anyone who did not humble himself and repent of sin during the cleansing of the sanctuary were shut out of the camp of Israel, hence a time of judgment. Therefore, the cleansing of the sanctuary is the hour of God's judgment since 1844. So every Israelite knew that when the high priest was cleansing of the sanctuary from the record of sin in the most holy place, that everyone was being judged. So judgment is going on right now in the Christian church. The final work of the earthly high priest symbolized the final work of our heavenly great high priest. Our great high priest is in the most holy place. Jesus died that we might be able to live with him forever, and that includes passing the judgment. The judgment is in our favor as long as we are daily repenting of sin, as long as we're not cherishing sin. Then the judgment is absolutely in our favor because of the blood of Jesus Christ. But all our sins are recorded, and they're right in the in the books of uh, the Lamb's Book of Life that's all recorded. But, but pardon is writ written next to the names of those who repent of their sins. And then the record of sin that is in the books, the record of all of the righteous, all those the record of sin for the righteous, they're removed. All of that record of sin is removed, but their name is retained. And so that is good news. So what does Jesus decide or determine before he comes again? According to Revelation 22, 11 and 12, he decides who's going to be saved, who's going to be lost. That's what he determines. So what does the Bible call that process in which Jesus determines who will be saved or who will be lost? It's a time of judgment. Where does this heavenly judgment begin? I repeat. It begins in the heavenly sanctuary, in the most holy place, when the books are open, Daniel 7, 9, and 10. So I say this, everybody. Open your door, the door of your heart, before he closes his door. Because look here, everybody, very, very soon, the door of salvation is going to close. And either you're saved or you're not saved. Very soon before Jesus comes, all of our names will be brought up and it will be determined. Are they following Jesus? Are they repenting of sin or not? If we hold on to sin, we cannot pass the judgment. But as long as we, according to the word of God, confess our sins, they are forgiven and we pass the judgment. We don't have to worry. So sometime before Jesus comes again, the, uh, every name will be brought up. Those who profess to follow Jesus Christ, all the names are brought up. But the judgment is for the righteous. If you're for Jesus, the judgment is for you. If you reject Jesus or you backslide and get, don't give up that backsliding, you stay backslidden, then when your name comes up, it's removed. That's why it's so important to be revived, to be restored, to be renewed. Jesus is judging for us as long as we are for him. If you have the son, you have life. If you have not the son, you have not life. So I say this in closing, make sure every day you just give your heart to Jesus. Make sure every day you repent of your sin. Yes, we're living in the judgment hour, but we can have confidence that Jesus died for our sins and the cross is our assurance of salvation as long as every day we come to the foot of the cross, surrender our heart to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Friends, Jesus died for you. Jesus intercedes for you. And sure enough, very soon he will judge for you. And then at the second coming, Jesus comes for you. If God be for us, who can be against us? So this is Mark Fox. Before I, I close, I want to just pray. Father in heaven, I pray in the name of Jesus that every person would be surrendered to you, dear Jesus. And every day we come to the foot of the cross and confess our sins and forsake them. 
Thank you, Jesus, that you never lose a case committed to you. Thank you, Jesus, for the salvation assurance that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. This is Mark Fox signing off for now. Remember, Jesus died for you.